Good afternoon, and welcome to the Warren Lecture Seminar Series. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Kumaswami Vipulanadan. And fortunately for me, for us, we get to call him Vipu. So I, I know Vipu very well, as uh, he and I were graduate students together at Northwestern. Uh, Vipu is now a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Houston in Texas. Um, he holds various titles there as he is the director of the Center for Innovative Grouting, Grouting Materials and Technology, SIGMAT. And uh, he recently started, believe it or not, the Texas Hurricane Center for Innovative Technology. Uh, and in fact, I think he may say something about that. As I mentioned, he uh, is a Northwestern graduate, having received his master's and PhD there uh, in record time and uh, doing quality work. Um, his undergraduate degree is from Sri Lanka, uh, his home country. Uh, Vipu is uh, quite uh, diverse in his research interest. Uh, Currently, he's doing work uh, on smart materials, and we'll see some of that, uh, with applications to oil, gas, and other infrastructure technologies. Um, he has been principal investigator, or co-PI, on over 70 projects. Um, Vipu was um, advised by Ray Kryzik, uh, who was a prolific, or is a prolific uh, writer, um, and his students follow because Vipu has over 200 referee papers, has graduated 25 PhD students and 65 master's students. He's received various uh, awards. Uh, the most uh, curious, I guess, is the MVP, the most valuable profession in 2011 from the underground infrastructure industry. He's been the keynote speaker at various workshops dealing with uh, oil well cementing, water and wastewater infrastructure, and emergency management. Uh, he was, I should have mentioned in the very beginning, department head at the University of Houston uh, in the Department of Civil Engineering um, for a number of years. And uh, now he's just a regular faculty member. But nothing regular about Vipu. So please help me. Uh, Welcome to Professor Hill. Thank you very much, Joe, for inviting me and also making the introduction. With that, I will get started. Basically, what you are going to hear today is related to development and characterizing of smart cement for real-time monitoring in deep oil well applications. So as uh, Joe pointed out, my name is very long. So I've just abbreviated it to be Vipu, and it's very easy to remember, actually. You know, VIP means very important person for you. So <laughs> you guys will never forget. And uh, yeah, I've been fortunate that I've been at University of Houston for over 30 years now, long time. And uh, we, during that time, we were able to develop one center this is about 20 years old now, Center for Innovative Grouting Materials and Technology. This is part of this research study that we are doing right now. And it is pretty much wo uh, focused on material development and evaluation. And also, we are fortunate that EPA also recognized our lab to do testing for them related to grouts and coating. So it's a kind of uh, EPA-approved lab. Also, recently, we started the Texas Hurricane Center for innovative technology. It's another important thing for us because every six months, that region is threatened by hurricanes. And what do we do? And main focus of our center is rapid recovery. So you will see that these two center activities really tie into the research work that I'm doing right now. I'm going to present that today and share with you some of the results we have. So basically, we were fortunate to uh, get this funding from the DOE and uh, NETL and RIPSI. They gave us about 2.6 million for three years to develop these smart cement materials and drilling mats. But today my presentation is going to focus on only smart materials because that's have a lot of interest and a lot of impact 
in some of the applications. So you will see, uh, uh, I'm going to now touch on that. So this is the start. And if you walk to Joe's uh, office, you will see the uh, US map with all the geological details. But now you can see the US map with all the oil and gas wells. And I searched for Minneapolis and I couldn't find it. And you can see how the distribution is. You want to really see how the distribution is. And then if you come to our region, it's all over the map. And this, some of these are offshore. So they are not on land, but they're offshore. But just to let you know how much active work is going on in the US for oil and gas. And all these are related to wells. And that's what today's talk is going to be. So just to give you an update on the architecture in the deep water applications. Deep water, ultra deep water architecture is something like this. Uh, you will see how well it's designed and put in place. You will see that uh, this could be thousands of feet in the ground uh, offshore. And then you have the wellheads. You will see number of wellheads that are being had, uh, done here. The well is below this. In addition to the wellhead, there are also a lot of pipelines, network of pipelines. So in order to maintain this infrastructure, it's a big challenge. Big challenge, and it all starts with the well. Wellhead, it has to be intact. If it is not in place, working properly, all the rest becomes irrelevant. So this is what our focus is. So now, just to take you to the architect of or how the oil wells are constructed. This is a typical schematic of the offshore oil well. You will see how the well is constructed. It's pretty much a telescopic construction. Very detailed. They start at this level and come down. But the critical thing here is the cement. Cement is the material that is going to tie the man-made structure to the earth. So cement, we are asking the cement to do a lot of things. And the thickness of this cement is only two inches or less. So you're asking for a thin sheet of cement to perform. And as engineers, we want to make sure that we do a good job in this. And this is the challenge. That's what I'm going to address and how we want to address this issue. Also, just the detail you will see when they pump the cement through the casing, cement moves up, but cement also will come into contact with spacer fluid. This is the fluid they use in between the drilling mud and the cement, so that drilling muds will not contaminate the cement. But the spacer fluid can contaminate the cement. And the question that we have is, how do we detect this? How do we know it's getting contaminated? At the moment, there are no technologies. There are no technologies. And this is where we came in to fill the gap. And this is what it is. Another major problem that we run into in cementing is fluid loss. Because the cement is the one that is interacting with the casing. It's interacting with the formation. And then, based on the formation, sometimes the cement might lose water. Because if the permeability is very high water might move into the formation. Or if there are cracks, we will lose the cement. And as of now, we have no way to detect it. So what we do, we keep on pumping the cement till it comes to the sea flow. But we will lose a lot of cement, and we don't know what's going on. So basically, our technology is going to address some of this. Can we detect the cement level with time? Can we identify the fluid losses? happening during the cementing. Is the cement hardening in this two inch gap deep in the ground? We don't know. Conditions change. Is the cement contaminated? Can we detect it? So these are some of the unanswered questions. So this is what you are going to hear uh, now. So you will see the integrity of the well is controlled by so many factors. So many factors, starting from, as I told you, geological formation, which really controls how the whole well will be drilled and how to install the casing. Then comes the cementing. Cementing, as I told you, is the bonding agent between the nature 
and the human structure. And that means if we demand a lot from the cement. And there are other issues that we have to keep in mind. We are looking at some of them, but today I will focus very much on the cementing side, which is a critical one. But you will see that steel and steel corrosion is an issue. And then also um, some of the construction methods used have to be carefully looked into because drilling process and mud removal are big challenges to make sure that the well is clean before we do the cementing. And there, as I told you, contamination is an issue, fluid loss is an issue. And then the interesting thing is that we want to come up with a material that we can monitor it during the entire service life. Not only during installation, but also service life. And that's what I want to talk about. So you can see, if you look around, what happened in this case? Cement failure. You will see that this happened in Australia. This was ongoing platform producing. Suddenly, things went away. You saw total destruction. And this happened close to us in Gulf of Mexico, 2010. Major damage. What happened? It is a cement failure. And you can see the destruction. And I just want to show you this, the extent of the damage and things that we want to focus on and see. But if you see, people have done studies on offshore in the US, blowouts. It is very clearly pointed out that over 45% of the failures are due to cement. There are, as I told you, there are other factors also come into play, but cement clearly stands out, cementing. And can we address this with new technologies, new ideas? That's what the study is all about. So basically, in a summary, what we have is that at the moment, we cannot monitor the installation unless we put in some instrumentation, but you are looking at a two-inch gap. You put instrumentation, you are causing local defects. Okay, And then can we monitor the cement during its entire service life? Because it's hardened and it has to support the system. Normally, these wells are designed for about 20 to 30 years. So they have to be in operation. Now, I just told you this is two-inch thick cement. Then what we are proposing and what we are doing right now is to bring new material technology to make smart materials to be sensing and address some of these issues. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. I will also look into some of the fluid loss studies we are doing and how to monitor them and things like that. So basically, this is the basic concept. This is the basic concept. Basically, you have the casing, you have the casing, and we cement the area and uh, finish up the work. What we want to do is this is our concept. We want to make the entire cement a sensor. We are not going to bury sensors in the cement. We want to make the entire cement a sensor so that it doesn't matter where the damage is, we should be able to sense it. If you put sensors, you can only detect what's happening close to the sensor. But if you make the entire cement a sensor, we should be able to capture contamination. We should be able to capture cracks. And we should to, uh, capture so many other things that may happen during the cementing to see whether the cement level is coming up. So basically, this is what I'm going to talk about. So what is this cement? What does it do? And then I'm also going to talk about how do we monitor it? It's one thing to make the material sensing. Another one is to monitor it. What to monitor, how to monitor, how to interpret the results. So this is what it is all about. So the concept-wise, we are looking at smart cement, no sensors buried in it. The entire cement is a sensor. And then we decide how to monitor it and interpret the results. So today, I will be focusing on development of the smart cement with uh, sensing properties. And also, I'm going to share with you some of the studies we have done where we are making the cement to be piezo resistive That means the uh, properties of the cement will change with stress and the chemicals. So they are sensitive to that. So it's called the piezo resistive And also, I'm going to talk about how we can demonstrate this real time, how to monitor it real time. We don't want any delays because if there are disasters, we want it real time. And that's what our focus is all about. So basically, the main question is, what do you want to monitor? What is sensing properties? What do you want to sense? So I just want to give you some quick examples. 
of this. And then I just want to mention about the well cement also, because word we talk about cement, we use it all the time. I just heard recently that cement is the second largest amount of material used in the world next to water. It's used so much around the world now, big time. So when you look at the oil well cement, it's somewhat different from our Portland cement. But Portland cement is the basic material, but oil well cements are modified to take charge of high pressure and high temperature. So the, we have put in a lot of gypsum into that to make it different, and there are different grades of oil well cement. Just to let you know, and in our case, we have to study from the microstructure to do the modifications. We have to understand the chemistry to really do the modifications and move forward. So you will see it. So in a nutshell, this is what materials, two materials are. One is the cement, other one is the drilling mud. You will see that cement is a liquid initially. It's a liquid. You put water into it, pump it into place. So it's a drought, it's a liquid. Then chemically there are changes occurring. We know that it becomes a solid. Whereas drilling mud and space of which all these are used in well operations, they are liquid initially. And end of the day, also after the operation, they are still liquids. So how do we monitor this type of changes deep in the ground? And how to respond to the changes and also how to interpret the results? So that's what I told you, major issues is cement solidification. Is the cement hardened? Or fluid losses are occurring during installation? Or even fluid loss can occur during drilling also. That's another big problem. Also cracking of the cement and the stresses that are coming onto the cement. So this is what we are going after. For, as I told you, today my main focus will be on the cement. And then I might add a few words for the others. Okay? So basically, now let's talk about sensing. Okay? We want to make the cement sensing. So how do you want to sense, make it sensing? This is human. Just to introduce to us, do you want to make your cement like your eyes? Just look at things and tell you, I'm passing this way or something is happening. So that's eyes. You want to make your cement like your nose to smell it and tell you I'm getting contaminated. How do you want to make it? Do you want to make your cement like your ears? Hear some noise and transfer it to you to say that I'm affected. Or you want to make your cement like your mouth because you want to see how to make it sensing, right? That's the word we are going after mouth and it will taste and eat and say food is good or you want to make your cement like your skin and also in addition to that we have to have the brain to control all this so our focus our study is focused on making your cement like your skin if you touch your skin someone touches you you know someone is touching you and you, you can tell how much load is coming on Pressing very hard or light, it's said. And can you see the skin only keeps you safe from the environment, right? And keeps interacting with the environment and interacting with your body. So that's what we are after. And as you said, as I told you, cement sheathing is very thin. So it's like a skin. So we are going to talk, make our cement like our skin. Very sensing. And also build the brain to capture all the changes and monitor it and interpret the results. So basically our oil well system based on our research study and concept is going to be a skin plus brain driven. And we have to build these two together. Just having the skin, if, if the skin could be very sensitive, good, but if your brain is not working, no point having the skin. So these two have to come together. This is a compatible system, building the system with the material technology and the control system interpretation technology. So just to uh, finish up this, the sensing properties, the, what we are challenged is, what do you want to sense? Do you want to sense the physical changes? You know, density change, uh, basically viscosity change and things like that. Or do you want to monitor the chemical changes in the cement? Or do you want to monitor the thermal changes in the cement? These are very important things to address because all these keep on changing. All these are changing. And what do we mean? Or do you are looking at the magnetic properties change in the cement? Or you can look at the electrical property changes in the cement. So our concept after our research, we have narrowed it down to electrical changes in the cement. 
And this is what I'm going to look at. Now, we are going to go after the resistivity, electrical resistivity, and I'm going to show you how sensitive the resistivity to all these changes. And then we have to interpret the results. So if we have a unified sensing system now, the resistivity change is true for the drilling mud also. So now with our technology, if implemented, you have only one monitoring system, will monitor the drilling mud, will monitor the cement, everything together. There are no different systems. One unified system, so we have unified all that. So uh, what is resistivity? Resistivity is something we learn in high school physics. Nothing new. Now we are bringing the knowledge and technology in here to interpret the results and make materials more sensing. So if you look at it, resistivity, you can measure it in any way. There are uh, petroleum uh, field-related digital resistivity meters. This can measure fairly high temperature and also the resistivity. Then also we have the conductivity meter. If you are a chemist, this is what you all use, conductivity, inverse, one, inverse of resistivity, same thing. You can use the conductivity. Then if you are a, a geotechnical person or geologist, you will use a four probe method to measure the resistivity. So there are different ways of measuring it because it's a material property. And what we are proving that it doesn't matter what method you use, resistivity is a material property, you end up with the same number. So you decide how to measure it depending on your application. So now I want to again bring it to your home. How can I interpret the resistivity? Say, now you have a bottle of water, right? The resistivity of a bottle of water is 20 ohm meters. That's what all of us end up drinking, a lot of water, right? But if you add something to the water, the resistivity drops. Just to tell you, take home. I want to take you home to relate it to what you have. Now if you drink milk, it has the lowest resistivity of all these liquids we have. Just to tell you. So it comes from 20 to close to about 3.5 just to tell you how the resistivity changes rapidly. And you can use this to even evaluate the quality of the material. So see how the resistivity is. And now the question I ask you is, what do you think the cement slurry will be? Will it be in between here or it will be below that? It turns out that the cement slurry, because there's a lot of chemical reaction going on and solubilization, it will be below the milk even. So resistivity of cement, I'm going to show you, is of the order of one ohm meter. And we know the density of water is one gram per cc. Water is all one, 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 one. So we have come up with a number that is easy to interpret. So you will see, and that's what I'm going to go through that, and you can see how the resistivity is sensitive to these things. So now, if resistivity is something to be monitored, are we just going after one number, or we are going after a number of other factors? And it turns out, for cement, the resistivity actually starts here when you mix it, and then it drops because there's a lot of chemical reaction going on. And then it reaches a minimum value, and then it keeps on increasing because hydration of the cement. And this is already proven. What we are doing is we are quantifying it and making the material more sensing and coming up with parameters. So you will see that detecting the Minimum resistivity is a good indicator that your cement is hydrating. And the time will tell you. It is hydrating under proper environment. If there is a big time delay to get the minimum, that means that your cement is getting contaminated. It's not hydrating. Just quick indicators. It's just not one number. You can really m monitor these things and do. So you will see that there are a lot of indicators. I'm just going to show you a few of them, but there are a lot of indicators we are coming up with. We have also come up with a resistivity index to identify the quality of the cement and things like that. So now just too many numbers here, but don't worry about it. Actually, this will be also on display so you can see. You can see how the, when the water to cement ratio is changing and how the resistivity changes. Let's look at this one. The resistivity of water to cement ratio 0.38, this is a typical mix that they use in the field. It's about 1. And then it goes to about 0.86, and then in 70 minutes, the minimum resistivity, and it changes, and we see... 67% or more change in the resistivity within 24 hours. So this could be used in the field as an indicator, as A, is it setting or not setting? Just simple numbers, and you can see that in this case, you get big changes depending on the cement mix, depending on the contamination. We will talk about some of them, but you can see how sensing the resistivity is. 
it is very sensitive to the changes very sensitive to the changes also another thing that we do as researchers is that we want to take the cement we modify it but we don't want to change the cement too much so our additives this is where the interest is our changes are less than 0.1% of the cement very little and we are proving how it will not even interfere with the hydration of the cement. This is a calorimetry study just to monitor the cement hydration with different additives. We put in different additives to look at it. We also work with nanotechnology and other technologies just to show you the indicators because we have to be very careful. We don't want to change the current practice. We want to enhance the current practice with making the cement smarter with monitoring system. So you can see it. So what are we going to monitor in the field? Monitor in the field, as you know, we will monitor the resistance in the field. How the resistance is going to change. And resistance, as you know, is related to the resistivity into the measuring calibration parameter, K parameter. I'll comment on this for the next few minutes. So this is what it is, resistance. So you can measure this. This is what will be monitored, and we can tie it to the resistivity. Also, change in the resistivity will be equal to change in the resistance. This is simple proof of that one just changing the resistivity because resistivity can change due to so many things including contamination stresses things like that so we can relate that just to let you know how these are so this is another new thing that we want to focus on so the question that we have is how are we going to measure the resistance or resistivity normally all of us know by simple theory it is like this we use a four probe method where you pass the current through the specimen, measure the voltage, and get the resistance. Now, how can this be adopted in the field where you are 10,000 feet in the ground and having all these complex methods? Now, we have come up with a method where you, we are using only two probes to get the resistance. And there is theory behind it. I'm going to quickly go through that. So we will be using this. And the important thing, our method is, our method will monitor the cement in the bulk material, not at the edges, not at the edges. This will be measuring the hydration, contamination inside the cement, how the cement is going on. So if you really look at it, we also have a publication on this. You can see it uh, in the ASTM. We, are used, we use impedance spectroscopy to prove it. Impedance spectroscopy to prove it, this, uh, how it works. So let me tell you. Now I told you that we are going after the two probe method, right? So this is an idealization of the two probe method, and I'm going to call it case one. This is one probe, this is the other probe, contact. So it is idealized like resistance and capacitance, because there is polarization and other things. It's, then the bulk material will be idealized like that. We don't know what the bulk material changes are going to be when you measure electrical properties. It could be resistance, capacitance, it could be any combination. So when you have a system like this, contacts and the bulk, your impedance will be of this equation. And this is all in publications and also you all can check it and see. That's the impedance and it has some unique values because impedance has a high value initially at low frequency and it goes to zero at very high frequency. Then the case two, we are looking at case two where Contacts are still there. The material could be represented by a resistor. resistor. If you do that, the impedance is like this. This is just pure theoretical calculations. No approximation, nothing. So the impedance is like that. So what happens is that if you look at the case 1 and case 2, it is like this. You plot the impedance for frequency. You sweep it through AC current frequency. The case 1 will do this if you have that system in place. And case two will do this. Case two will do that. And the question is, what do we have with the cement system we have? And we have proved it over and over again that our cement system will be like this, at this high frequency. It's going to be controlled by the bulk resistance, case two. And then we can go after that. So you, we have proved that. So now all our measurements are using the AC current at very high frequency. We will actually sweep it through and get the impedance and make sure the shape is right. And then you can see the K factor remains same over several hours. The K factor, the calibration factor, just to show you. And we have come up with these two probes. It's easy to adopt and measure. You don't have to worry about anything. It's just a simple wire, simple wire system. There are no specialized things in there. 
okay and just to now tell quickly tell you how sensitive this resistivity and we use what we call the LCR device to get all this because they will sweep it through the frequency and get you now for instance here you can see it's a two wire system we are measuring the resistance of water you are looking at about four kilo ohms as soon as we drop a little bit of salt the same device will sense it it's all same device will send it and drop to 150 ohms just to tell you how rapid the reading and how sensitive these are. No delays, not much delays. Now I'm going to get into the smart cement that we are working on right now, just to tell you how to compare the results. Basically, we, we, this, these are called piezo resistive materials. Uh, basically, you can look at the stress stra uh, resistivity change, and also I have plotted the stress strain. The strain for the cement at failure is about 0.2 to 0.3 percent, 0.2 percent to 0.3 percent, and it fails straight. But if if you go to the resistivity change, you are looking at a, a change here of about 80 percent or more for the same stress. And then at small stresses, you can see how the resistivity of the smart cement is changing. So from the change in the resistivity, we can tell you how much of stress is on the material. This is what we are doing. And we moved from DC measurements. We started with, now we are doing AC measurements. Same material. Look at the numbers. This is in the 80s. Now this is in the 500 to 600. They have become so sensitive. Why? It's very clear. We have taken out the contact resistance. And this is the bulk resistance changes. And then when you load it, material goes. And then when there is a crack, the resistivity changes a lot. And from these changes, we can identify the condition in the cement. Condition in the cement. And then also, as I told you, we work on nanoparticles and nano additives and things like that. Just to show you some typical results, we are looking at some metallic nanoparticles. Because depending on the environment, people like to use different things. And we want to see how the material is sensitive. You can see this part is giving you the strain. We measure the strain. And also, we measure the resistivity. And strain is the failure strain is around 0.2, as I told you, whereas the failure resistivity is around 60 70% or much more, depending on the mix you have. Then we are also looking at nanocarbon fibers. Just to show you how technologies can be adopted, depending on what you want, you can see how the response is. Basically, we have the results for the stress and strain, and also we have the results for the stress and the resistivity change. And oh, just follow the uh, numbers. They are of the order of magnitude different. Okay? Then we also are looking at the sensitivity of cement, because cement in the field is not used alone. They put additives based on the environment. They have to put additives. They put a lot of uh, sodium metasilicate. This is sodium metasilicate. And then you can see, as soon as you put the sodium metasilicate, resistivity drops. And then you are looking at very small additions, and the resistivity drops. So from this, you can also control the quality of the mix, and also know that cement is being mixed with additives. Then if your cement is getting contaminated with the drilling mud, the same cement, as I told you, the cement resistivity is around 1. If it is getting contaminated with about 0.1% oil-based mud, this is another popular um, uh, drilling mud they use because they don't use any particles here. And this is popular with some of the formations and all. So if you have 0.1 contamination of the cement, this goes from 1 to over 2, doubling the resistivity doubling the resistivity, and you can see how it's increasing rapidly. So resistivity, monitoring the resistivity, will tell you that your cement is getting contaminated. Contaminated. And you can see, just to show you the contamination and how the resistivity doubled with a small amount of contamination. Now, we don't have these things to detect. We don't know whether your cement is contaminated or not. not. But with this new technology, yes, we can detect that. Also, I just want to show you that when the cement gets contaminated, it also affects the piezo resistivity. Now, for instance, you saw the cement without contamination works very, very high changes in resistivity with loading. But when it is contaminated, then the change in resistivity is also affected because there is oil in the cement. And this also will tell you that your cement is contaminated from the changes you measure. So this is what it is. Then I just want to touch on a few things uh, in addition to this. Uh, basically, we also do a lot of modeling, 
material modeling, and this is uh, uh, what we call a PQ model, stress strain model that we have developed to uh, predict the stress strain behavior of any material. Actually, you can use it. We started with polymer composite. We are using it for cement, and actually, this equation is used in Europe a lot. They are using it for concrete and others. They use the PQ model. We call it PQ stress strain. We developed in the 90s, and this applies to our material. Just uh, just to show you how well it can fit in, it, the one equation will also give you the strain softening behavior and things like that. And this is, can be used for this cement uh, that you can see. Also, I just don't want to go into all the details, but we also have model for piezo resistive behavior. And all this, you can find it in the literature. We are changing the resistivity is related to the change in the stress. And you can see we have to bring in a lot of material properties because we are tying resistance, electrical property, to a mechanical property. And you can see how to tie it in, and we have worked on it. We have modeled a lot of behavior, and they are doing fairly well. And these are increment, these are an incremental model, so we can really capture things very well, and you can see how it's modeling. And then we can get different shapes for different resistivity behavior. Some of them are like this. Again, this model will do it. I'm just showing you one of them, just to show it's a nonlinear incremental piezo resistive model, just to show you how we are quantifying all this. You know? So you want to make focus on it. Also, moving on, another thing that we want to prove is the viscous properties, rheological properties are not modified. Our modification has to be minor because if you modify the viscosity, then it's difficult to pump the cement in. So we want to make sure, so we actually do viscometer studies, we monitor things, and these are modified devices because we may monitor the resistant changes and things like that just to show you. And then you will see that uh, viscosity here, we are looking at the shear stress versus shear strain rate and how the viscosity is affected with different additives and things like that. And you can see that we have two models actually. We have two models. Uh, the broken line is the uh, HB model currently being used. And we have come up with a new model. We have come up with a new model. It's called the hyperbolic model because our model is much more practical. The current models used in the uh, literature and by the petroleum industry is not realistic because in this one, when the strain rate goes to very large amounts, the stress goes to infinity. And you and I know no material will stand up to infinity stress, but still we are using it. Now we have modified this, and we just had the uh, first paper on this, published only last month in the Journal of Petroleum Science and Engineering. And you can see that we are proposing this hyperbolic model to predict it. I don't want to go through all the details, but basically this model captures all the phenomena, including limiting on the maximum shear stress a liquid or cement can stand. We developed this for drilling mud. Now this works for even cement. So I just want to show you that how this has been developed. Also, I just want to touch on some of the facilities we have because, as you know, this cement has to be tested at high pressure and temperature. It's just not room temperature. So we do have high pressure, high temperature facilities. These are commercially available. And in our case, we have modified these. We have modified this uh, currently available because the companies do not have uh, monitoring things for resistivity. We have come in, we have modified it. You can see all this. It's all modified now. We can monitor all this while we do the experiments. Pressure, temperature, things like that. So we want to make sure we can reproduce the results within the limits we have and show people how the changes are. So you can see, and also in our case, we are looking at the fluid loss with different rock samples. A lot of the current studies are based on filter paper. And that's what we are using and interpreting. But we want to use that as standard method, but we are bringing in rock samples, shale, sandstone, and things. We put it in this and study the filter losses and things like that. Much better quantifications. And we will have some publications soon, but at least to give you some idea how things are being done. Also, as I told you, I want to touch on the fluid loss, which is an important thing. Typical fluid loss that you get in these uh, cement samples are of the order of 120 milliliters based on the API standard. But now we are really trying to lower it down to with nanoparticles, lower it down, and we are really come up with much low values now. We are really working on it, and we hopefully we will have good results very soon. Also, just to now go to the field. I want to take you to the field to see how these measurements could be done. 
what do they do now? They, what they do is that this is the casing, this is the cement. This is from publications. I did not do it. It's, I just took it from the publication. How to mesh, how to instrument the casing to get cement information. So basically, they lower these acoustic emission devices into the borehole, and they are very clear that nothing can be got about the cement sheet. This is the technology we are using right now, guys. They go in, check the well. They cannot say too much about the cement. And they are saying it all. I mean, I just got it from the literature. Also, they have another method. They have another method where they lower the probe, and they contact this, and then pass current through it and measure the resistivity up here. So what is happening is that you have the cement sheet, which is about two inches. These formations could be hundreds of feet. And they cannot capture this resistivity because they capture the overall resistivity. And this is issue. This is a current issue. And this is what we want to show is there is current technology and we, where we can take them a little further to much better. So I just want to share with you. So now we are in the process of demonstrating us our thing. So you will see that I'm going to show you some uh, uh, lab models, basically what it is that is the casing that we have and then what we are going to, to show you is that when the uh, this is level, when the cement level rises or liquid level rises, we can monitor the resistance changes, we can monitor the resistance changes and give you where the liquid is. We can, where the liquid is. This is all uh, level 4, level 5 means you can see. Level, when I mention level, that means it's vertical. Also, we are monitoring uh, the uh, thing horizontally also. This is just instrumentation. We are just showing you, and I have come up with a new technology. Earlier, we were looking at the casing. Now, we don't even touch the casing. We have come up with new technologies to monitor this. So this is what we want to push new technologies out there to monitor it. And this really gives you some indication how the resistance is dropping. The resistance is dropping when the fluid hits the level. It's a level, the resistance is dropping. You can see we are also looking at the cement. I just want to quickly uh, move on. Uh, looking at the cement, how the cement level is rising from level one to level two, and all these are being monitored, and you can see how the changes are. Now, for instance, this figure will tell you how the vertical resistance is changing. Initially, no, no cement. As soon as the cement got into level one, the resistivity dropped. And when it reaches level two, the resistivity drops. Level three, like that, it's marked here, you know. A, B, C, D represents the horizontal. One, two represents the vertical. So C1, C2 means it is C side, uh, A, B, C, D we had, C side, one and two. So you can see how when the cement level comes up with our instrumentation and with the cement value, everything drops. So you know that the cement has filled that bowhole. It has filled that bowhole at that level. And it has not gone beyond that. So you can really monitor it real time. And then this is the horizontal resistance. So you really look at the horizontal, how the horizontal resistance will change. Again, we are just showing you the figures and how the changes are. So these are rapid changes and big numbers. These are not small numbers. These are huge number changes. So you really know the change has happened. And then move on. Just to show you, these are lab model tests that we are doing. And this is another interesting one where we had a very high water to cement ratio of cement. We just put it in there. This was the resistivity we measured. And within hours, it actually bleeding was there. And then the resistivity on the top doubled, more than doubled. So you can really get this and say something is going on in the cement and modify it. Uh, also, just to summarize some of this, this is a history of it. When you do the well boho, what happens is that you will have to do the drilling mud first, and the resistivities are way high. Then when you put the space of fluid to push the drilling mud out, the resistivity drops. And then when you pump the cement, resistivity goes up again because the space of fluid resistivities are much lower than the cement. So you can see from the history how things are developing in the borehole real time. Real time, you can just monitor them while you do the test and things like that. So this is what is of interest to us. Also, I just want to show you some of the things that we have done to demonstrate. Now, this study, this is a continuing study in the models. This study is over 30 days now. We have done it for 30 days. Cement is hydrating in the models. Cement is hydrating in the models. And these points are the experimental points that we are measuring in the in the. Uh, more models, and we are predicting, we have come up with models to predict it. 
So we can predict this for very long time. We have the models to predict it. So if the resistance is within that range, you should be happy. Everything is going good. But if there are uh, cracks, then the resistance will jump up. Or if the cement is not setting, it will be down. So these are, uh, we are quantifying all that. I'm just giving you a physical feel for it. But this is how you can keep monitoring it. And this one, we can give you before you even start the drilling. Because we have the knowledge now to tell you this is what you should expect. And then they can try it out. Then we also are now doing large model tests. This is a large model test that we have. We have a big chamber. As you know, uh, some of our previous work is on deep foundations, you know, on piles with my colleagues and things like that. And we are using the same chamber to do the cementing now. We are using the same chamber with modifications because cement will really cement all the formations and things like that. So you will see that our new model is like this, much larger model. Earlier models were of that size. Now we are doing the larger models and we are trying to produce our results to see how repeatable they are so before we go to the field. So we are learning a lot. We are instrumenting them differently. And as I told you, our technology doesn't even touch the casing anymore. We can instrument the sheet and get all the results. That's what is happening. So you can see how this big model is. You can see we can also give you the temperature because we have also some thermocouples in here to give you the temperature, how the temperature is changing with time. You can see this was the initial temperature when we started, and then with cement hydration, temperature goes up and then cools off. You can see it, and then we can also get you the resistance. All these are monitored just real time to give you the numbers, how things are changing, and this all tells that cement is hydrating and we are fine, and then we also have the models to predict it, and you can see that cement uh, resistance have increased, but it's a little less than what we predicted, so here you can see that we can reason it out with the temperature changes and things like that. This is just from direct resistivity measurement. So, in a nutshell, this is what I want to conclude uh, today. Basically, what we have done is we have identified the resistivity to be the sensing property for the smart cement. And you saw the performance of the smart cement. And also, with our approach, you can really monitor the changes during the curing. Within the 24 hours, you can get the RI24, as I told you. This is the resistivity index 24, which really changes big time depending on the cement mix and the conditions. And that will be a good indicator. Also, we have made the cement to be piezo resistive. And you can see that it's a very sensing material as far as stress is concerned, and also when there is contamination, things change. And our additives are of, of that order, very small. And also, we have successfully demonstrated the real-time monitoring, and this has to be developed further to larger scales to make sure that it's useful in the field and things of that nature. With that, thank you very much for your attention, and glad to answer any questions. So you make the point that by um, making the entire material a sensor, you can detect uh, um, anomalies uh, no matter where they are located, right? Uh, yes. But at the same time, I guess that you're not able to triangulate the anomalies, right, to, to tell me where they appear. So, if, for example, if you have to uh, put a patch to the problem, uh, you might not be able to do that. Is there any, are you have any thoughts or are there any techniques to sort of be imprecise in uh, pinpointing where the problem may be yes, occurring? Yes, uh, uh, yes. The answer is this. It depends on how you instrument the uh, sheet. You can, you can have the wires at a foot interval and tell you this is happening between 72 and 73 feet. Or depending on who do you want to instrument it, you can instrument it at 100 feet intervals. Then you can say, it's which interval it's happening. So it could be caught, and it's going to depend on how the service companies are going to use this technology to interpret. So it depends on what is critical for you. Some of them are saying that bottom of the borehole is very critical for them. So they are going to heavily instrument the bottom and then come to the top. Left to them. Our technology will catch it. Depends on how you instrument it. So if you want to uh, capture anything, you have to be having the uh, bias there. It will capture it right away. So you can really narrow it down.
you for your talk. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the first is, do you have any challenges with, fi with the fact that you use fibers in terms of direction preference for the resistance? Um, and then my other question is, um, with your like measurement technology, not the cement itself, um, do you have any challenges with the corrosive environment or things like that? Because those wells are typically very um, toxic. Okay, uh, the first one is about the fiber orientation. If you see, our additives are less than 0.1%, so it's a very small amount, and we have uh, actually tested this with different modes of mixing and testing. I think our sensing properties have said that they are very sensitive. There may be slight variation, but that is not affecting the results of performance. Because, it's, uh, because the orientation is not much because you will see that it depends on the size of it and things like that. So for us, so far, it has been pretty good. And the second one was uh, on... How corrosive, uh, like, whether you have any trouble with the instrumentation over it? Okay, the, the, the question is, uh, uh, how good are the instrumentation? We will guarantee you that uh, the instrumentation will be equally good as the cement or even better than the cement. Let me tell you, because the problem we are running into that there are some IP things on the table, and uh, I've been told I cannot talk too much about it, but at least you got the concept, I think. And you all can think about ideas, you know, because that's what we are going after, because you don't want to bury anything that is more dangerous than what's already there. So we are going after that. So, and that's helping us a lot, actually, yeah, to enhance the cement performance also. Hi, Professor. And so your monitoring system's output is resistivity. And uh, we are focusing on the relationship between the uh, strain and the resistivity. Uh, however, there are uh, some other factors, such as salinity, humid humidity, and the temperature that uh, affect the resistivity. So my question is, how do you consider the influence of these factors when you ma uh, measure your resistivity? Yes, uh, I think it's a valid question. It's always asked, are we just going after the resistivity? No, not really. We are really going after the change in resistivity with time and the rate of change. I didn't talk about that, rate of change with time. So if you say that uh, humidity is changing, you have to have some quantification of how the humidity is changing with time, right? That could be factored into this, and that will tell you how the resistivity will change with time. Now, for a good example, could be the stress. If you know that how the stress loading is going to come onto the cement, with time, you have the stress history. You can factor that into this. So resistivity with time is the drive, and the indicator for some of these is the rate of change. The resist, not the total number, but the rate of change of resistivity will tell you whether it's getting contaminated or whether it's cracked. You know, if there's a crack, rate of resistivity will just jump like that in a very short time. So this is part of the interpretation. In the part of the interpretation, how do you want to use resistivity and identify the changes? And everything is going to be related to the time. And time quantification is important. So if you can quantify the conditions in the borehole with time, we will tell you what the resistivity will be. Hope I answered the question. Okay, we can continue the discussion at the reception, so please join me in thanking again Vipu. Thank you, sir. Please join us in the reception. Thank you. Yeah, good job.